All right, hi everybody. Thank you so much for coming. I'm so excited to see this crowd for what I think is a really important topic, women and their representation in tech. Today we're gonna have an hour with these two amazing leaders. I will be the moderator, my name is Heather, and I am the global head of comms for Atlassian. These two ladies are going to share their stories, their journey lines, tips and tricks for all of us. I think we'll really be excited to learn from them. I will do a little bit of an intro, although Anu probably doesn't need an intro if you were there this morning for the keynotes. She did an amazing job, right? Anu is our president of Atlassian. Anu has been behind most of our major transformations here, whether that's to the cloud, and of course you saw the AI work this morning, that's all Anu. She brings together our engineering teams, our design teams, our business teams to create awesome stuff for customers. So awesome, thank you Anu. Thank you. And then Heather is the founder of a company called Solve that she founded in 2016. That company has the mission of really bringing together patients with great healthcare, and to do that in a really simple way. Heather has also held positions at, of course, Trulia, but also in tech, in politics, in, in business, and she's a great member of our board of directors here at Atlassian. So thank you both for spending oh. the time with us. And I will jump right in, and I think I'll start with you, Heather. Tell sure. us a little bit about your career. When did you really realize, hey, I'm really driving some sort of transformation in my career, and did gender have anything to do with that? Jumping right in, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've had a lot of career moments. It's hard to highlight one moment where I thought, wow, now I can be impactful. You know, when I graduated college, I bought a one-way ticket to DC because I wanted to work in politics. I had a lot of moments in politics. At some point, I thought, man, this business thing seems interesting. I wonder how it works. Maybe I should go make a pit stop over in the Silicon Valley so I could learn about tech, which was sort of my, my second love after politics. And then I got the opportunity to build at Trulia from 12 people to ultimately to our IPO and sale before I started Solve. So I've had lots of moments. When I saw that question, I did think about one story. And it was when midway through at my time at Trulia, where I was running our core B2B business. I owned the P&L, I managed the product strategy, I owned the revenue number, and our CFO said to me, how do you like being CEO? And I was like, what are you talking about? I think in my mind, I've always thought of myself as like the scrappy, in the trenches, really awesome number two. And it is a moment that sticks out for me because he highlighted something that was, I was doing, I was doing the CEO job and probably not once in my life prior to that had I thought, that's probably a role I'm gonna have for my next phase. And so I think that moment, that was, I had two more years left at Trulia before I started Solve, but it planted that seed of, this is something that I'm not just good at, but I really like. I and launched one of the reasons why we end up launching Solve. I love that. And you, do you have a similar moment where you think back on your career and you thought this, this stands out for me? And again, the question of gender, did that play a part in it at all? Yeah, that's a fascinating question. Going back to, um, did you lead a transformation and was there a defining moment? Um, like Heather, it, it feels like a series of moments, yeah. right? So even today when I have to fill a form to go to Australia every time on an Indian passport and they ask occupation and I write engineer, and I think, well, I have not quite <laughs> been an engineer for a while. Uh, but if I had to think of one moment that stands out, it was um, during one of our transformations at Atlassian, uh, we were shifting from a business model of being behind the firewall to SaaS. And it was a very disruptive change for us, as you know. Um, it, it was changes across engineering, sales, product, finance, the story we tell investors outside, the story we tell our own employees, the stories we tell our customers. And in one of those uh, phases, I had to go to our sales kickoff. And I was running engineering product teams then, and I had to go to our sales kickoff and tell them, you know, the way you've been selling products so far, that's got to change. We, we have to transform ourselves into something completely different. And this, you're going to have to start this from scratch. And with an engineering background, I felt intimidated. 
to go into a sales gathering and tell them how to do their job. That felt like, oh, they're going to think, who's this random person coming and telling us what to do? And so I landed up in the sales kickoff the previous uh, night, and I thought, let me go to dinner with a few of the salespeople and see what it's like. And I sat down at dinner with them, and the dinner conversation turned to, so what's the one thing you're most excited about, which you recently acquired? What's the newest purchase you have? And people around the table, one of them said, oh, I bought this new vacation home up in the mountains. I'm really excited to go stay in that cottage. And somebody said, well, I bought a new boat. I'm really excited to take my friends on it. And the person next to me said, I bought this really cool car. This was in Amsterdam. And uh, they said, I bought this really cool car, and I'm excited to travel on highways across countries with it, so it's going to be really cool. And it was my turn. And I thought about the latest purchase that I had made that I was really excited to go back home and get into. And it was a textbook on the evolutionary history of slime molds. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm sitting there excitedly explaining the amazing thing about slime molds and the link in evolutionary history and why I'm so excited to read a textbook. And that pretty much killed the dinner conversation. <laughs> And I thought, oh man, I am really not one of them. Imagine <laughs> standing up tomorrow morning in front of this crowd and telling them, you know what, I have this great idea, you have to completely change the way you work. So I came back and I called up our then president, Jay Simons, who ran our sales and marketing org. He was the one guy in sales that I felt comfortable going and saying, you know, I told them about my textbook on slime molds. And he <laughs> laughed and he said, it's okay, it's not that you're not one of them, but think about what is the common purpose that binds you and the sales teams, right? You're there for a reason. You ended up taking time out of your schedule and going there to tell them a story. So what is it that really binds all of you together? What's the common purpose? And that common purpose was serving our customers. And he said, that's absolutely right. So you should think about it as, what do salespeople want to do? They want to serve customers. What do you want to do? You want to serve customers. You believe the future for customers is in cloud. So explain that to the sales team and tell them why they need to transform. So think about what's common that binds you together with these people. And that was very sage advice. And through transformations that I've led since then, that lesson has stayed with me. That it doesn't matter whether you feel different, look different, don't quite feel like you fit in. Remember the common thing that binds you and everybody else, and that'll carry you through the day. I love that. Well, if you look at this room, the common thing that binds us all together really is this really important topic about women in tech. You mentioned Jay as a, somebody that was a mentor to you. How important do you think mentors are, and is Jay one, and are there others, and why? Um, I can please. Uh, so mentors are definitely very critical um, throughout not just your career, but I'm a strong believer in learning from other people. I'm inherently curious, so I really enjoy talking to people who have different viewpoints who can tell me something about why a foundational belief I hold is wrong, or here's a new way to think about things. And I think that's a very important process in which you grow as a person. And for me, through my career, the mentors I've had have not necessarily been people labeled as mentors or people who I thought of as, okay, here's a person that I will constantly go to for any problem that I have. But it has been mostly, as I have encountered different situations, I've built up enough trust with different people that I thought, hey, that person solved that problem really well, so let me go and ask them for advice. And I have always been surprised at how open people have been and how willing they have been to help. So I, I have tried to pay it forward by doing the same for other folks that have approached me with problems that I may have solved before that I could help them with. I think that's an important lesson for a lot of people that look for mentors, a lot of women that come to me with those requests too. Typically, successful people have constraints on their time. So they can only take a finite number of people as mentors. But what's really useful is if you think about people as, hey, they're mentors in a particular situation, in a particular skill, for a particular problem, it doesn't have to be some consistent, ongoing thing. Mm -hmm. 
but make sure that it's useful to them as well, that it's a two-way conversation. The, I have found that very helpful where I go back and tell them I tried this, this worked, this did not work, and it feels like a fulfilling thing for the person who's trying to help you and mentor you, mm -hmm. as well as for you as somebody that's trying to learn from this person. I love that. Heather, any thoughts on mentors or sponsors in your career? I mean, I could not agree more, actually. Um, one of the more uncomfortable conversations I have is when someone comes up to me and says, can you be my mentor? Mm -hmm. Not because I don't want to help. I actually love, I love helping to build careers and giving feedback and that two-way conversation. But there's something about that ask which is so heavy in advance of any mutual benefit or dialogue that I have personally found it challenging. Um, in my own career, I've had a number of people who have played important parts at that moment in time in my career. Right? I can think of Jennifer James. I worked in PR after I was in politics. I looked around and I thought, she seems like the smartest person in the room. <laughs> what did she do with her life? And I started asking her questions, and she's become a very good friend, was the reason why I went to business school, never thought about it before then, and was really important for a number of decisions that I made as like a sounding board, and we did that for each other mutually, even though she was ahead of me in her career. I think about Paul Levine, who was my COO at Trulia, who again, he was just a few steps ahead. So I wouldn't formally call him a mentor, but for that phase of me taking on this first big cross-functional job, he became a real, he became someone I was vulnerable with. I think increasingly he was vulnerable with me and that really helped supercharge that phase in my career. I think about today, and there's actually no one person that comes to mind. I have a, a group of eight women that I'm on a text message string with. Mm -hmm. We went to business school together. We're roughly the same age. Our career journeys have progressed. And we've seen a lot of challenges. And that group, whether it's comp negotiations, trying to close a deal, or something that's bothering me personally, is sort of my mentorship group. And, um, and so it just has evolved. It's critically important. Um, I agree with you, Anu. There are, then there's a much broader group of people, which are people that I will reach out to. Maybe I haven't talked to you in months. But there's a two-way relationship where we, it's a norm that we can reach out, have a candid conversation, help each other without the, the mentor weight of a, of, of a title. So that's how it's worked in my career. I think there, there are a number of people that I have, I have mentored um, but not in the way that I read in some of the articles and books, which is that one-on-one -on -one person who's always coaching you consistently. Mm -hmm. I like that a lot. Speaking about mentors and learning from other people, you mm -hmm. both gave examples of learning from others. Is there any advice, maybe I'll ask you, Anu, that you've gotten in your career that sticks with you? You shared a story a few minutes ago. Is there anything else like that uh, that sticks with you as you think about advice? Um, a particular story about advice that I received. I, like Heather was saying at the beginning, um, there are moments in time where I feel like I've received useful advice where it may not have landed with me at the moment, or in fact, even a few years down the line. And then, at some point of time, I thought about it, and I thought, oh, actually, that was really good advice. And one example of that was building a community of women. Right? So when I started out in my career, I started my career at Microsoft being a video games developer. I was a computer science engineer, and I got out of school straight into that job. I couldn't believe it was a real job. I was like, you'll pay me for this thing? This is cool. <laughs> Sign me up. And when I joined Microsoft during the early months of joining, I met a woman who was a VP of engineering, and it was a chance meeting. It wasn't something I set up with my own initiative. And she said, hey, it's cool that you're working on this game. Um, just make sure that you build a community of women around you that you mm -hmm. can go to for help and support when you need it. I heard that and I thought, huh, I don't understand this. Why do I need a community of women? 
like in my head, I was a middle-aged white man because everyone <laughs> around me <laughs> were middle-aged white men. So I was like, I don't know this thing about creating groups of women. Why? What's the difference? And also, I had grown up in India in the 80s huh. with a very, very privileged childhood, as I realized later, hmm. because my mom raised me with the belief that everyone is born equal. It doesn't matter if you're a man or woman. What matters is the effort you put in into a situation. So I had this naive belief that everywhere out in the world, that's what it looks like. Hmm. It's all about equality. It doesn't matter what your skin color is, what your gender is, none of it is relevant. So when she gave me that advice, I thought, this is an odd piece of advice, whatever, move on. <laughs> and over the years, as I experienced um, what the external <laughs> world actually looked like, I started getting comments around, oh, girl developer, interesting. Why don't you comb your hair? And are you sure you want to give a technical talk? And I, at first I thought, this is odd. Why are you asking an engineer if they want to give a technical talk? What else will they do? That's all they know. <laughs> <laughs> and then it struck me, wait, all the guys on the team are not getting these comments, it's just me who's getting this comment. This is odd and unfair at so many levels. And it took me a few years, I have to say, because foundational beliefs are hard to shift. I kept thinking, ah, maybe it's just one or two incidents, whatever, just keep pushing and it'll all be okay. And it took me a few years before I realized, actually, people do treat men and women differently. <laughs> and it's not just the men who treat women differently, yeah. it's also the women who treat women differently. Because yeah. uh, sexism is so inherent and so, so many unconscious biases that we learn that we do it ourselves to other women. But over the years, I found that as I built community and friendships with women, as Heather was saying, they've all gone through the same experience. They've all had to deal with the same bullshit. So you're like, okay, here's a group of people that I feel like I genuinely belong with, that I can share my experiences with, that I can learn their lessons, that they had to learn the hard way, maybe I don't have to do the same thing the hard way, and I realized the importance of community. So when she gave me that advice early on in my career, I was not ready to receive it, hmm. but about a decade into my career, I realized <laughs> the wisdom of that advice. Um, Thinking about men in the audience, there are a few, so thank you for coming, uh, who want to uplift women and want to make sure they're well represented. Hmm. Anu, Heather, thoughts on that and what can they do? Um, so three pieces of advice I would give, yes. knowing that there's uh, quite a few men in the audience. Um, and these are things that I've seen other men in my career do and has been particularly effective. One is to give credit. Uh, uh, the thing that Heather said, it has scientifically been proven over and over that it happens to women where they espouse an idea, they state a thought, and mm -hmm. that does not get attention, whereas if the same thing gets repeated by a man, it gets more attention. And it automatically gets accredited to the man in the room. Um, the way you can help with that is when you notice that happening, give credit. Say that, oh yeah, uh, you made the same point that Heather did, and I agree with both of you. It's fine. <laughs> Share credit. That would have been so awesome, and it did not happen in that moment. Yeah. But making sure that you give credit, and yeah. even when you want to state something that somebody on your team said, or your peer said, mm -hmm. or your manager said, who happens to be a woman, cite the source and say, like Heather said yesterday, I think we should do the following. And it doesn't take away from you, it doesn't make you any mm. small. It actually makes you the bigger person because you're attributing credit to the person that the thought originated from. Second, I would say, be a cheerleader. More uh, women than men, again, proven with data, show that, uh, data shows that more women than men often tend to hold back. They tend to mm -hmm. wait to check all 10 attributes of a job qualification before applying for a job, whereas men don't even bother checking first five of the 10. And they're like, yep, let's go. What's the worst that can happen? They'll say no. <laughs> no one knows anything anyway. We're all just figuring it out. Right. I always have an answer. It might not be right. right. <laughs> and so when women have to yeah. fight against the tide and speak up and espouse an idea and push for an action, it has already taken considerable effort. So as a man in the room, you can be the cheerleader for the woman in your life and support them.
And it matters a lot, especially support in that moment, because even though externally it might feel like, oh, this person is very confident, they've totally nailed it, it may not be what their internal state is. So being a cheerleader is always appreciated and helpful in any given situation. Third, I would say, be a sponsor. A sponsor is different than a mentor or a cheerleader. A sponsor is somebody that is actively advocating for the women that they're supporting in areas where opportunity comes up. They bring up their name. Why don't we actually ask Heather to run that new marketing campaign? Or there's a new role that opened up. Heather may not be qualified on paper against all the 10 attributes, but why don't we give her a shot at interviewing for that role anyway? Uh, so being tangibly there for women and creating opportunities, opening up spaces. This doesn't mean be, give, give them an unfair advantage at all. It actually just means make them visible, give them the opportunity, bring them to that doorstep. After that, whether they make it or not is totally up to them. But being the person that opens up that door for them, that is super helpful. Um, so those three, I would say, are concrete things uh, I would love for the women, uh, for the men in our lives to do for the women in their lives. I'm going to add two more if I can remember them. Um, the first one is, and this is for men or women, by the way, it's proactive one-on-one -on -one coaching. So you're in that meeting and Heather tries to make a point and it's very clear that she was not effective helping everyone in the room understand that. First, do what Anu said and say, like my colleague Heather said, <laughs> this is what I believe. But second, take the time to follow up with that person one-on-one -on -one afterwards and say, I'd love to give you a little coaching on how you can be even more effective in that meeting. I'll give you an example of, of one that happened to me that was so profound. I was pitching for our first money at Solve. I, it, it was the stage of fundraising where you're not in front of the full partnership, we are just in front of a couple of people. And I'm pitching the story and I have my list of 10 things that I must be perfect at versus just talking about the first two, <laughs> uh, which is what you're supposed to do in fundraising. And it was a woman who was a partner who worked against her own self-interest. She pulled me aside and she said, Heather, you are way underselling your story, your personal story, and the opportunity with Solve. And I need you to hear this from me, even if it means you might go with someone else. Um, and it was so impactful. I didn't even know I was doing the thing that is proven with data that women do, which is show you end to end how competent I am versus sharing the vision and the story. And she pulled me aside and made that happen. So do that. I had a second one, which was, I don't recall, but do a news three things and that one, and then we should be all set. <laughs> Love it. Great. Um, switching gears a little bit on just personal, more personal um, train of thoughts. Uh, first, what do you do for yourself? You have this big job and you know, competing priorities. One, how do you think about prioritizing? How, what systems and things do you have in place? And then what do you do to sort of keep it all together? Any thoughts on that? Oh, <laughs> so that means people actually do think I keep it all together. Thank you. <laughs> that, that is very kind. Um, the keeping it all together reminds me for all of you in the room, if you get a chance to speak to somebody here, uh, the one person that I think of when I think about keeping it all together, managing a superhuman amount of responsibility, and yet never ever looking like things are out of control or ne never looking like, oh, they don't have one fact in place, is our chief admin officer, Erica Fisher. She's in the room. If you can wave, Erica. Uh, she's my role model in terms of how to keep things together. Because Heather and I are of one mold. We are very much like, oh, my head is blowing. I'm going to let everybody know my head is blowing. <laughs> So um, in terms of prioritization systems, I'm sure all of you have your own prioritization systems, so it's helpful to think about what works for you. The one thing that I repeatedly say to my teams, um, my teams are here, they're smiling at me, is use <laughs> first principles thinking. 
uh, make sure that you build a system that works for you. Whoever says this is best practice, you should do it, is probably wrong. wrong. So find out for yourself what prioritization systems work for you. Likewise, your question of what do you do for yourself, um, the one thing that, the one principle that underlies the what do you do for yourself that I constantly have to remind myself, and one that I think women especially tend to overlook is uh, we tend to think about taking care of ourselves as the last priority. Take care of our kids, of our families, teammates, neighbors, community, and maybe in the, in the end, if there is some time left, we will take care of ourselves. Um, but the thing that really uh, struck home for me as I was going through different phases of my career and I was re running really close to burnout was that self-care is never selfish. It's merely good stewardship of the only resource we have available to ourselves, which is our own time and energy to have any kind of impact on the world. So whatever self-care looks like for you. For me, self-care looks like three things. Uh, one, I'm a huge animal person. I took a year off as a sabbatical in the middle of my career, went to Africa, raised lions, chased cheetahs across the <laughs> desert with GPS collars on them, took a job as a safari guide, drove tourists around to show them elephants and lions. Um, so I'm a big obviously, wildlife nerd. Obviously you did that. <laughs> <laughs> Makes perfect sense. <laughs> I'm a big wildlife nerd, so I love spending time with animals. And just spending time in the presence of an animal calms me down, soothes me. So I make sure that even if it is my pet cat or the neighbor's pet dog, just having some time with um, animals is a great source of soothing and relief for me. That's one. A second one is just having friends at work because we spend so much of our time uh, at work and so many of our emotions come to the fore at work that <laughs> it's helpful to have someone that you can feel vulnerable with, yeah. that you can share stories with. Um, for me, one of the great examples of that is my engineering partner, Mike Tria. I go to him and I'm like, oh man, today my manager just didn't get it. MCB, Mike Callen Brooks, who's my manager, I'm like, ah, MCB's just <laughs> not getting it. I'm trying to tell him this thing, but he's sending me somewhere else. So I can shoot the shit with Mike Tria, my engineering partner, and he's a friendly face, a shoulder to cry on or somebody to cheer me on when things get hard. And it's not just a work relationship, and this was also a personal learning for me. I always hesitated to make work relationships hmm. friendships as well, because I was like, oh, what if that taints my perspective on this person? It's okay, we are all whole people. We bring our whole selves to work, and we have to trust ourselves that we will still be fair and objective at work, and still be able to maintain friendships at work. It's important to refuel yourself. And the last one is to find the source of awe, of wonder, mm. right? It, it's what nourishes you. Um, and often it's easy to forget that and keep running. The daily grind of things can wear you down and kind of put you in a source, in, in a state of languishing. Uh, the pandemic taught us that, right? It just feels like a con consistent state of blah. And before you hit that stage, when you see this uh, kind of red, uh, red signs or sparks of feeling like you're languishing, understanding the source of nourishment, of what really fulfills you, what really brings you back. And it's not just the, I'm gonna grab a croissant and a coffee as a ritual, <laughs> but also the, what really moves you. Right? It could be religion for somebody, it could be spirituality mm -hmm. for someone else. For me, it's just the spirit of wonder in the natural world. Just looking up at the sky and seeing the stars and feeling a sense of perspective of, oh boy, we are really on this planet in a very mediocre solar system, in some <laughs> very ordinary spot in the galaxy, just gives a sense of perspective of, oh wow, the world is so big, the universe is so big, and we are all really just a small connected part of it. Love that so much. Um, we're far too similar, Anu. <laughs> you might have had a more diverse panel next time, Heather. Um, I mean, similar and different. Um, you know, uh, my levels of intention around my, my self-care have never been higher 
than they are today. Um, and for me, that was really born out of need. You know, I, I have three kids. I have the opportunity to sit on this amazing board uh, of Four Atlassian. Um, I'm the founder of a startup that's trying to solve a really big, hard American healthcare problem. And it's a lot. And I, you know, um, in my soul, I'm a grinder. I'm a kid of immigrants. I persist. It's what I've always prided myself on. I remember one time in therapy, I was couples therapy with my husband. He was going on and on about all the things that he needs. <laughs> <laughs> He's great, by the way. He is great. I love him. He is great. And he's self-aware, far more than I am. And the therapist looked at me and she said, Heather, what do you need? And I said, I need him to get what he needs so we can just get on with it. <laughs> that is not applause earning. I am sharing a story that my own awareness mm -hmm. around what I need has been so low in my life. Maybe it is a bit of a superpower that I can persist through it. And today, that's no longer the case. Mm -hmm. You know, as we scale our careers and the scope of the things that we're managing as 360 people gets bigger, for me it has become much more important to be intentional around what do I do for me. Mm -hmm. um, and so I came up with a few mantras um, because for me they were just short statements to remind myself of the things that matter to me at this moment. One was invest in my strength, is, these are my current, that I think about, invest in my strength. The second is cultivate gratitude and joy. For me, that often means laughing with people that I like and taking a step to appreciate the things that I have. And then the last one is dream. Because in the rigor of doing all the stuff and admiring myself for my get shit done gene, I can often forget to dream. Um, you know, f so number one is sort of spending the time to articulate for myself, what do I need in this moment? And putting it to words. Forgive me if that seemed cheesy to you. It, I find it very helpful for me just to remind myself. And then I have some simple daily practices, week daily. I spend my weekends uh, watching basketball games <laughs> for my sons and my daughter's jujitsu and running errands. But my weekday practices, I do a couple of things. One is I wake up in the morning and I don't, this is gonna sound annoying, so I'm gonna try and make it as, um, as non-annoying as possible. I do a daily stretch meditation mm -hmm. thing, just me. It's me, I sit in the same place in my family room, I give myself between five to 30 minutes of pause. I think about those mantras. I stretch. I don't judge myself when my mind wanders or I accidentally jump on Twitter, even though I try and remind myself to put it down. But that moment has helped me start my day feeling calm and centered, reminding myself how I can thrive versus jumping right in. So that's one, the stretch meditation thing that I do. The second one is I do carry an annoying journal. <laughs> It's so, it's a meme, I know. But let me tell you why it's not annoying, is that I'm, I don't do, for me it is just a, I think of it as a space where I can process in an analog way, in a non-judgmental way, to help me sort my thoughts. This started for me at moments in my career where I thought, I'm so overwhelmed, I can't even talk about it. All I can do is tell you I feel very overwhelmed. And so creating that space has become something, I don't do it daily, I carry it with me, my journal's in my bag. Uh, whenever I want, I pull it out, I jot down a couple of things, and it's been a real unlock. And then the third one is I move my body. Right, uh, very tactically, I try and get two one-on-ones on my calendar per day that I can take while I am walking around. Zoom life is extraordinarily hard, we're an entirely distributed team at Solve, which is really advantageous in some ways, really hard in others. And so being outside, moving my body, 
every single day has been sort of the third practice um, that I've just sort of oriented my own self-care priority around. And so far, so good. I don't go anywhere without my journal. Yeah, yeah. it's great. Yeah. It's just space. It's For space, me, it's just space. I, I literally say in the beginning, yeah. this is space between you and I. Yeah, yeah. It gives us the chance to do that privately. Right. Anu, talking about um, more personal things, thinking about your younger self, if you were to sit here looking at the younger version of Anu, what advice would you be giving to yourself? Um, I would think about it as when I started out my career, like I was saying, as an engineer, it really was the sense of wonder and adventure that I remember the most. Um, for an engineer to be in a company like Microsoft checking in code into the kernel, it's very much like a kid in a candy shop. You're like, your mind is blown at, I can't believe I'm getting to check in code into the kernel, and so many people can actually use the work that I'm producing. Awesome. Um, and throughout all of it, like Heather was mentioning, there, there were moments where I felt like my instinct is telling me to do something, but that's not what everybody around me are doing. So maybe my instinct is off here, maybe I have to recalibrate, but now, with the benefit of 20 years of hindsight, I would tell my younger self, just trust your sense of self more, right? Hang on to that sense of self, where it's okay to create space for yourself. And when your opinions, when your instincts are contrarian, when it looks very different than everybody else, don't think of it as, oh, I am not able to fit into the system, what's wrong with me? but reframe it as this system doesn't fit me. So go explore the world where there is a system where you do fit. Uh, find your home where you can be your true authentic self. Um, and I think you gain some of that confidence, some of that insight, some of that perspective over time mm. and with experience. So it is difficult for me to give the same advice to a 21 year old starting out today and have them viscerally internalize it. Uh, but as I look back, th that's the one thing that I try and implement it even more now. I, I was just telling my team this in one of the weekly update videos. I just turned 40 last year, and I was on a trip uh, in the East Coast with my 14-year-old nephew, and the, the, it was fall foliage, it was beautiful, it was my birthday, so I was like, 40-year milestone, let's be really reflective about it. And he asked me a question of, uh, why are the fall leaves turning orange and red and yellow uh, during the season? And the nerd in me is like, oh, the scientific answer to that is that chlorophyll breaks down and the <laughs> anthocyanins in the leaf take over and anthocyanins are the ones that are giving this red and yellow color. But the magical thing about leaves is that the anthocyanins were present in the leaf all through the year. It's just that in the beginning of the year, in the in during the youth of the year, the chlorophyll, which is the green color, masks that anthocyanin, right? And over the year, the chlorophyll breaks down, and the true colors of the leaf come to the forefront. So really, as the leaves age, they're becoming more and more of themselves. Mm -hmm. And I feel the same with myself. I feel like as I'm getting older, I get more and more of myself and find my authentic self even more. Yeah, awesome. And, and aren't we lucky that the system at Atlassian works for you so that you feel at home here? We're lucky for that. Um, Heather, for you, your younger version of yourself. I would say you're so awesome. <laughs> I would say keep going. Yes. Yeah, keep going. Have yeah. fun. That's yeah. what I would say. Yeah. Like, go to it. Don't worry. You're awesome. That's what you should say to yourselves. Love that. Okay. And, Heather and I were chatting at the table, and she said, I'd also say, you're doing great. Yeah, Keep you're going, doing great. you're doing great. Yeah. Love it. Put it in your mantras for the morning. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I think this would be a good chance to give you all a chance to ask your question. So we're gonna open it up for some Q&A. Great. We'll put a microphone back there. If you have a question for either one of them, just come on up to the microphone, and we'd love to take your questions. While people are coming up, I love that story on the leaves. You know, I mean, similarly, I think about how so many times um, 
where I was in a room and I thought, man, I'm nothing like these people. Is this gonna be okay? The reframe of, but actually the difference that I am is the reason I'm in the room. Mm -hmm. And using that as your, one, the acknowledgement, but also the power that comes from that um, versus you know, trying to mask who you really are. Because the reality is, you're never gonna be as good as the other person if, if you're putting on a mask to be like them. They will win that battle, mm -hmm. whatever the battle is. Mm -hmm. But when you can take off the mask and be your true anu as mm -hmm. the president of Atlassian, like that, that's what gets us to victory. And so I think that power is hope, something hopefully we can pass on to you all in this conversation. Because in that difference is power. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. In that difference mm -hmm. is power. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> OK, any questions from the audience? It's actually, I guess the microphone is up here if anybody has a question or thought. If not, I can keep going. All right. Hi, I'm Sarah, and I work with, is it on? We can hear yeah. you. Um, I work with Dual Commercial. We've talked about mentorship, and I'm, I'm really grateful and lucky that in my company I have gentlemen who do that. Um, but your question really struck a note with me, and your answers did as well. So what I want to ask you is, do you think women mentor differently than men? Men kind of, no offense, gentlemen, take another one under their wings, and they're like, hey, these are all the ropes, and this is all the things, go do. And I have found that women tend to be there for the, each other situationally over a long-term relationship. Do you find that to be true? Do you find that we mentor differently? What are your thoughts? Thank you. I can go step. ahead. Yeah, please. Um, thank you. That's a great question. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's actually some pretty astute observations. Mm -hmm. You're right. I, I think overall, if at the risk of overgeneralization, yes, I think the way that men and women build community is also different, yeah. right? And therefore, as a derivative, how they mentor somebody, how they coach mm -hmm. somebody might also look different. <clears throat> um, Having said that, I think the more interesting question for all of us in the room is to say, hey, how do I effectively derive value from both men and women as mentors? Mm -hmm. So what can I do as the mentee to mm -hmm. orient myself in a way that I can extract the value and the advice and the goodness that I can learn from each of these people with different styles? And stylistically, that might look different. And it's okay. Yeah. Right. So several times I have encountered situations where men and women have come to me and said, you know, I really would rather prefer working with a coach that's a man or a coach that's a woman, likewise for mentors. And it, it, it's all about personal chemistry and it's okay. Mm -hmm. If you have a preference, that's perfectly fine. And you're right, it, it does look somewhat different between how men might choose to mentor somebody versus women choose to mentor somebody. But also, there are several other factors that go into mentoring styles, not just the gender, but their life experiences, what they have experienced themselves from mentoring relationships, what kind of mentors have they seen? So what does a role model mentor look like for this person? And it's also a very teachable skill. I feel like I have become a better mentor over time. I was a pretty shitty mentor to start with because I was very task oriented. I was like, okay, cool, you have this problem. I will help you solve this problem, let's go. <laughs> and that can feel quite transactional. And as you noted, that probably is more prevalent amongst men. So I would work absolutely brilliantly with men. And it took me some learning to work with more of the longer term, not transactional, but more relational uh, kind of uh, modes. Um, so I would say don't be discouraged if you see those differences. Yeah. Yeah. And if you have a preference, also know that it is perfectly fine. The world is big enough to accommodate all of us. Yeah, what a great answer. Um, I would, I would um, add to that one thing that I've been coaching women on and I've been talking about with other women in my network is let's be more transactional. You know, um, I think, again, at risk of generalizing, but I'm going to do it, is, you know, I, I look at my business school class as an example and how, many, how much deal flow has been sourced by the men in that business school class versus by the women. 
I have extraordinarily successful female investors in my business school class, and we have these longitudinal, very supportive relationships. And one day we said to each other, we need to transact, like pass deals back and forth and not be uncomfortable with passing deals back and forth because us supporting each other over time is great and us closing revenue together is great. <laughs> and so that actually was an evolution probably in my last five years. One thing we did at Solve, born out of this, was one of those friends called me and in my last fundraise, she said, I think it's time for us to be more transactional. And I think you need to talk to your investors and say, I'm gonna put more women on Solve's cap table and I wanna rate, and you should raise a female only SPV as part of this fundraise. And it, that was so absurd for so many reasons. One, I was done with the fundraise and no founder wants to reopen a fundraise when you're done. But two, she was saying, we, this is a moment where we get to be transactional and you have a platform where you can do it visibly so other women can be more transactional, which I think is extraordinarily important for women to be successful. Um, so that didn't directly answer your question, Anu did, but I think it's very important for women to do both. And Saul did it to Heather's credit. That was a historic moment, so. Yeah. Thank you. You mentioned being an immigrant is part of your identity. I'd be curious to know, and I think both of you are, mm -hmm. uh, what piece of advice do you have? What may be funny or uh, difficult stories in your life that could help us learn a little bit from that? I'll go quickly. I was born in the States, but both of my parents are immigrants. Um, so raised very much in an immigrant household. And someone said something to me, which I loved recently which was, work like an immigrant, raise money like an American. <laughs> and I thought, like, that is it. <laughs> because very much my work ethos comes from being raised in that Los Angeles immigrant household. And so I guess I would answer, there's so much good from how different people are raised and so much good in this much more, um, whether it's Silicon Valley or American way of doing things, and if you are from an immigrant household or an immigrant yourself, what an advantage to have both and to be able to really take the power that comes from that immigrant household, which is how I think about it, and then be able to play on this playing field, which is frankly much bigger than the ones where my parents were born. Thank you. Um. This one is more for levity. I, I am an immigrant in the US and I also lived in Australia for the job at Atlassian. And I remember when I had moved to Australia, because I'm from India, I'm originally born and brought up in India, and the stereotype about Indian culture is very much that women are raised to be somewhat docile, take care of the household, um, all that sort of thing. So when I went to Sydney and I was looking for a house in, um, a neighborhood called Manly. It's a beach neighborhood. I went up to the realtor and I said, oh, I want to rent a house here. He looked at me and he said, yeah, I don't know, not many people like you rent here. And I, I was um, ignorant enough that the comment didn't even make any sense to me. So <laughs> I'm trying to explain to him, yeah, yeah, I'm a tech worker and I work in the city <laughs> and I'm sure there are tech people here. So I'm trying to kind of find out what does he mean by your kind of people? And all my answers were wrong, because I was giving him tech company examples, and then I was like, oh, you mean like leisure time? How do I spend my time? And I've seen this fight club in Manly, that's where I'm going to go, because I'm a trained kickboxer. So I was like, I want to do real fights, I don't want this cardio kickboxing shit. So I'm going to go to the fight club, and Manly is great, because it's close by to the fight club. And you see his eyes are widening by the moment because <laughs> none of the stereotypes are matching. And uh, I'm like, uh, I travel a lot and he, he asks me, so you, do you go back to India? And I'm like, no, I, I have visited 41 different countries so I tried to do like three or four countries in a year and it's really convenient to get here from, get from here to the airport. 
And finally, he was like, no, I just mean that people from India don't stay here. <laughs> and I was like, oh, OK, oh, that's what you Thank mean. you. <laughs> like, so the identity you have as an immigrant um, mm. perhaps appears a lot more obvious to other people than it is to you yourself. And sometimes that can lead to funny situations. And in my case, I always felt like a little bit of a misfit in India. Uh, because, like I was saying to Heather's earlier question, I always felt like, man, this system doesn't fit me. I don't want this white dress wedding. I don't want to raise children, which is all like very taboo in India in a social setup like that. So I always felt like, yeah, I'm a little bit of a fake Indian because none of my <laughs> none of my inclinations and tastes and preferences seem to match the people around me. And then I rock up in Australia and I'm like, I found my tribe. Here's a bunch of <laughs> vegan people. They're going out there and rescuing <laughs> cats. And <laughs> I feel like, OK, this is my tribe. I got here. And ironically, the person who was trying to find me a home in a place where I felt like home, the first thing they noticed about me was, oh, she does not belong here. So, <laughs> sad, but ironic, but also funny. Yeah. Thank you. We should call him right now and tell you, you're now the president. So. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Um, I wanted to take it back to the comment that Heather made earlier about like somebody saying the, the suggestion that she had. Um, and I know that Anu mentioned that one of the things that people can do is like, you know, give credit. Um, but what do you suggest you do when there's not that partner in the room that gives you credit? How do you self-advocate? How do you say, that's what I just said, professionally? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think there... I was not in a moment where I would have been able to say, that's what I just said professionally. Had I been in a different place, I think that would have been entirely appropriate, which would have been something like, thank you, Emmanuel. Maybe it wasn't clear, but the example I was providing is very similar to what he just said, and it might try and restate it in a way that I could be heard. I think self-advocacy is super important, um, and so you shouldn't be afraid of it But I want to add one thing. I was that fire red guy in the moment. What I have learned over time that has served me well is in those moments, and I've had so many, to just hold them lightly. And what I mean by that is if I immediately assume that everyone in that room is a misogynistic asshole who never wants me to grow and be a leader at my company, of course I'm pissed. If I hold it a little more lightly, I maybe can see that Emmanuel expressed it. This is recorded, and I'm using names. <laughs> <laughs> we'll edit it for you. <laughs> he said it in a way that was easier for them to hear. And so what can I learn from that? Right? If I hold it more lightly, in the follow-up conversation with another executive in the room, I can bring it up, not in a way that's accusatory, but in a way where we can both learn. So if I could give one piece of advice on that, it is try and hold it a little lightly. Not saying don't advocate, definitely advocate, but I've often seen the reverse and the pendulum swinging to every Thing that happens is the biggest event and the biggest slight. Um, and I sometimes worry that that is not as productive than the, than the honest conversation that you can then have, you know, if you hold it lightly. Thank you. Yeah. Because by the way, if he is trying to shut me down, I'm going to kill that guy. You know what I mean? I, sorry, I just want to be clear. I just want to be clear. But I'm not assuming every time that that's the intent. Right? I'm not starting with that's what's happening. I want to be a bit more like a new. Like, what? It could never be gender related. It must be, you know, something else. So that you can address it in a productive way. Hi, Elisa Aviles Budwin, Atlassian State and Local Government. Um, Heather, my, my question is more directed to a previous comment that you mentioned about the advice of when in Rome, right? Mm -hmm. How do you maintain authenticity when 
while polishing into a mold that allows you to get what you need, right? Yeah. yeah. But how do you get people to digest yourself without necessarily breaking yourself into smaller portions? Yeah. And is that even possible, right? Super possible. Very possible. If I went to Japan and they were all speaking Japanese, if I knew I had a meeting coming up, I probably couldn't learn Japanese that fast. I'm not as smart as a new who can figure everything out very quickly, but I would do whatever it takes to learn to speak the language to be effective. That doesn't make me any less Heather. I am still me, right? And so if, if being effective in a meeting might mean speaking in a way that can be heard, I am authentically speaking in a way, trying to be heard. I don't have to talk like this all the time. I don't have to move my arms around. I talk like this with my friends. You know, I can be that. You can be a whole person without, I, I can, without feeling like I'm giving up a piece of myself. In fact, the most feedback that I get is how authentic I show up at work because I do think it's important for me, it's a bit of a superpower, right? I look different than most of the people I have sat in rooms with. That is obvious to everyone in the room. <laughs> like Anu trying to get her rental in Manly, in Manly so she can kickbox. <laughs> it was very obvious that she was different. So I never try and hide that. I just try and understand the same way that you would when you're trying to close a deal or work effectively with a product partner, what's going to make me effective here? And then I do that as me. So I hope I'm answering your question. I think it is possible to be whole and to make the adjustments, learning, how to, learning about Japanese culture, understanding the technical intricacies of something when you're trying to get an important project done, that doesn't take away. It doesn't make me little pieces, makes me more, makes me bigger. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hello, my name is Emily. Um, I actually live in Manly, so if you want me to find <laughs> that real estate agent for you, I'm on it. Um, I am a future of work enthusiast, and I have the pleasure of working with the Atlassian people team, who I think are just the best. Um, and I'm really proud of the way Atlassian thinks about the future of work. I would like to understand your view on the role women play in defining the next evolution of work. Awesome, thank you, Emily. We should hang out. <laughs> um, great question. Future of work is uh, something we think about a lot at Atlassian. And the whole concept of fully distributed work is something we leaned into rather than leaned away from early in the pandemic. And we've learned a number of things over the years. Annie Dean, who heads up our Future of Work initiative on Erica's team, she's done a fantastic job of um, evaluating what this actually means for different people. So when you look at um, different studies, it's quite often the women that enjoy the benefits of fully distributed work simply because of the additional set of responsibilities they carry in their daily personal lives. They're often the primary caregiver, the primary parent, and therefore having that flexibility is often far more important for women than it is for men. And this is what we've anecdotally found ourselves at Atlassian too. A lot of the people that come up to me and talk to me about, oh, Team Anywhere is what we call our Future of Work initiative, who say, oh, wow, Team Anywhere has really been helpful, is really uh, largely more women than men, because it gives them a degree of flexibility and autonomy mm -hmm. and um, a sense of choice that is far greater than what we typically see with men. Uh, in terms of how, how, what role should they play in defining the future of work, they should definitely play the same role as we would expect half the world population to play in <laughs> any major decision in terms of lifestyle, in terms of work style, in terms of how the future of both our work life and our personal life looks. Right? And, and unfortunately, while that's the ideal reality that we would like to live in, unfortunately, what the 
general distribution of power actually means is that it's not often the case. Therefore, as women in the room, what we can do to help the situation is really advocate for what works for us, for our lifestyles, to push for it, to ask for it. And you've seen this play out in the tech industry where at the beginning of the pandemic, everybody was like, oh, this is just a temporary phase, let's do this three-day minimum, two-day minimum, and I've seen companies start from like a four-day minimum, go to three-day, two-day, and then one day, and please, half a day, maybe. <laughs> and eventually, it's really the employees that get to dictate what actually works, and the numbers speak for themselves. Productivity goes up, we've seen, we've been able to recruit different kinds of talent, different kinds of um, regions, um, and also form more diverse teams when we do that. So asking for what is important and pushing for, and voting with your feet, choosing the companies that actually support these kinds of lifestyle choices, work style choices, I, I think those are important ways in which we as women can influence the future. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. I do have a fun announcement before we close, so we'll end with you. It's actually probably a quick question anyhow. Um, Heather and Anu, you guys mentioned several times how you've changed paths in your careers, and you've, I really was hoping you could speak to how you handled those choices in front of you when you maybe had several paths and you weren't really quite sure whether to go left or to go right. Um, yeah, take that one. I'll start. Um, I think I... I worry sometimes that young people in their careers don't feel as free. I mean, I'm, I'm 47 years old, right? So I've now been doing this work for however long that makes it. <laughs> and one, at each moment, at each inflection point, there was a combination of being extraordinarily rational and like, where does my will, like what drives me? And listening to both sides of Heather when I'd made those decisions ended up landing me in exactly the right spot at that time. Where if you look at my career journey on LinkedIn, it will seem quite confusing <laughs> and nonlinear. As I tell the story of my career, it's me becoming more of my leaf <laughs> <laughs> and following this combination of I'm ambitious, I want to do these interesting, I want to solve these interesting problems, and my desire is to do it. In each of those moments, I'm also a kid of immigrants, which me, who came to this country for opportunity for their kids, and so was very much ingrained on, you know, my mom would have loved for me to work at the post office because there's a, I could get a pension, <laughs> and it was stable. And so I was not brought up to take a ton of risk. So there was a third element, so it's like rational, ambition, it's will. I always ask myself, what if it totally fails? Then what happens? And for me, there was some answer to that, which seemed pretty damn good, right? So at Solve, when I, after Trulia, it was really time to get my big girl job. My mom was very excited. <laughs> <laughs> for me to work at a company that she'd heard of. Um, I didn't do that, but what I did do, so one, I had the will to work on this healthcare problem, and I had the capacity to do it. I called a number of people, my peer group, and I said, hey, if I fail, would you hire me? <laughs> and, to, and that was a serious conversation. Yeah. To do what? What if it takes three years? What would happen? Because for me, I just had to rationalize my downside case. So that, that is my answer. It's like the combination of, like, I'm ambitious, I have a place where I want to go, and that's always part of it, but it wasn't linear in the way that I hear people talking about now. Two, it's like, where does my heart take me? What is the problem I really want to go where I feel my fire? And three, what's my downside scenario? Seems pretty good. That helped me make those decisions. Uh, for me, it was uh, non Linear career, like Heather yeah. said as well. The I cheetahs wasn't linear between like Microsoft, <laughs> Chase Cheetahs. <laughs> Go back. Fascinatingly, so I started out as an engineer, 
And the first few years of my career, like Heather was saying, the advice I give to most new grads starting out is that, look, the first few years of your career, just learn. It doesn't yeah. matter how much yeah. uh, status it has or what the title says or how much money yeah. you're making. Treat that as grab all the experiences you can get the broadest surface area of and then figure out which of those speak the most to you. So I, when I was an engineer, I basically was like, oh, cool. For me, the mental model was, it's a video game. What should I do to level up and go to the next level, right? <laughs> so I was, like, I was an engineer for a while. Then I thought, oh, those researchers over there, they're having fun. They're filing these patents and all that. It sounds cool. Let me go over there and see what they're doing. So I switched to being a researcher, filed a few patents, and realized, oh my god, this patent thing is a lot of book work. I'm writing more <laughs> documents than code. So cool, five, got five patents, said, no, let me go over there and see what those testers are doing. They look like they're having a lot of fun yeah. and playing with toys that come out every day. And finally, um, I went to a conference, um, a developer conference, where I spoke to a customer who was using something we built. And he said to me, um, hey, we are using your build deployment product, and I can go home 20 minutes earlier and put my kid to sleep, and I get to like play with him for a bit before he goes to bed. And this is so cool. Thank you so much for saving this time. And my mind was blown. I was like, whoa, all this fun and games we are having at our desk, it's actually having an impact on somebody's life. Yeah. That's the job I want to do. I want to go figure out how I can have an impact on someone's life solve their problems and build something cool with people that I enjoy working with that's going to solve that problem. So I kind of naturally found my way to product management where when I read the product management job description, I was like, oh, this doesn't sound like a job. This sounds like what I would want to do for fun. This is great. So um, I kind of meandered my way and landed there. And I would say the core value that drove me there is a sense of adventure because really I wanted to see what, what's there in the next level of the video game that I can go and <laughs> mine all the gold, gold coins, so to speak. <laughs> but after a while, um, it also, um, to Heather's point of the whole cheetah and the sabbatical thing, there was a phase of uh, my life where I felt like, hey, the greatest impact I can have is perhaps outside of technology, so I want to go try that out. So I literally went and spent um, a few months on a farm, learning to be a farmer and trying out something completely different. I don't know if any of you are familiar with Woof, willing workers on organic farms. You basically go live on a farm and learn how to grow potatoes and yams and stuff like that. So I did that in New Zealand. And I did a year of nonprofit work to see what, what's the greatest impact I can have, maybe outside of technology. I want to try that out. Again, a sense of adventure of mm -hmm. what's out there that um, you can go learn new things about. And there, the thing that struck me was a lot of what drives me intrinsically as a person is velocity, action. And it felt like, oh my god, I just went from like 200 miles per hour to about 40 miles an hour. And everything is just going slow around me because in a volunteer-based organization, yeah. it's not like a large organization that's set up to serve a customer mission. And I, it helped me discover that, hey, that's one of the driving values for me. It's one of those intrinsic motivations that I need. And I really miss technology. So I'm very much a technologist at heart. And when I came back in the second phase of my career, it occurred to me that solving customer problems is not necessarily a function of which role you're playing. You don't have to be a product manager to solve mm -hmm. customer problems. You really need to have the intent of, I want to solve customer problems, build something cool. And you can start to create roles around yourself. You can start to kind of navigate towards the jobs that whose titles may not sound like the obvious ones. Because I have this distinct memory in uh, school when somebody introduced themselves as a COO. And I thought, wow, in what world would they want to be a COO? And last year, I was the COO <laughs> of classes. <laughs> and so you change your mind when you know what's yeah. your core value, what's the intrinsic motivation driving you. So just being open to that and not boxing yourself in as, I'm an engineer, I'm a scientist, I'm going to only do that, not ever going to go on a farm and grow potatoes. I think that's a good one to think of. Great. OK, well, before I thank these two, um, I want to just share that when you came in today, we scanned your badge. And they have been so generous to um, participate in a raffle. So we're going to do a raffle. And two winners, 
the two winners, what they get is one hour of one-on-one -on -one coaching with these folks. So if you didn't scan your badge, make sure you do that. Uh, we'll follow up with more details and go ahead and schedule that. But thank you both so much. This was such a pleasure to moderate and I hope you all enjoyed it. Thank you guys. Thank you so much. So Thanks much so to much. learn from.